Hello and welcome to another edition of Conservative Corner. We are very glad that you're with us here tonight. We are extremely glad because we are very happy. We are overjoyed. <laughs> we are living in total nirvana, politically and otherwise. Why? For obvious reasons. Because we, Republicans, the Republican Party of the United States has won the triple crown of politics. And that, of course, is we won the House of Representatives, the Senate, and above all, the presidency. And we have a very friendly and supportive Supreme Court to make sure that everything's done right over the next four years. As Jackie Gleason once said, how sweet it is. It doesn't get any better than this. <laughs> so that being said, we're very overjoyed, and it shows, and I'm smiling, I guess is smiling, okay. and everyone in our Republican orb is smiling. However, not everyone in the state is. Why? Because we're a very liberal state, and it's run by the Democrats. We unfortunately, in the Republican Party, have no statewide elected officials like we did before. That's the way it is right now, and that's unfortunate. In the last election of just a few weeks ago, of course, we had a very good state, um, a very good statewide candidate named John Deaton, who ran for the Senate against Elizabeth Warren. <coughs> he beat her in both debates. He was a much better candidate and would have been a, a much better senator, but he lost. That's unfortunate. We also had some very good state reps who ran and deserved to win, especially Vlad Yanovsky of Newton and Ginny Gardner from our new TV studios, who also ran a very gallant campaign and unfortunately lost um, to the incumbent, Democrat incumbent, of course, in her town of, Wells, uh, of Wayland. But that's how it goes in our state, at least for now. Right. But nevertheless, what has happened on the national scene, on the national scene, is really a political earthquake, a political juggernaut, so to speak, in a very good sense. Again, you have the Republican Party for the first time ever, and I checked it out, you have to go back 100 or 120 years even, maybe even into the 19th century, to find such a monopoly that the Republican Party ha now has on politics, on the federal government. So wonderful things are going to happen. And to all of our liberal Democratic friends who think that the world is crashing down on them, have no fear. The best, the things that are going to happen to you, to us, to the country, will happen to you as well. Gas prices are going to go down. Inflation will go down. The price of milk, the price of eggs will go down. Wonderful things are going to happen. Deregulation will be everywhere. And yes, we're going to have clean water, clean air. <clears throat> and by the way, we're not going to have any wars because our president, our incoming president, is dead set against doing that. We're not going to get bogged down in wars in the Middle East, in Eastern Europe. It's not going to happen, unlike the fear of if the other party got into power. <clears throat> so your sons and daughters turning 18 or uh, young adults can be rest assured, it's not going to happen. We are entering a golden era of peace and prosperity. And I stress that, the double peace. And it's so important that you believe that. And if you don't right now, eventually you will. And no, <clears throat> Donald Trump is not evil incarnate. He's not a racist, never was, never will be. He's a very good man, and he'll be a very good president. And his interests lie in the United States of America. He has four years <clears throat> to accomplish a great deal, and he will accomplish a great deal. And we as Americans will benefit as a group, as a country, totally, whether you're Democrat or Republican. Have faith. Give the man a chance if you didn't vote for him. Trust me, you'll be glad that you did. And trust me, at the end of four years, you'll be much better off than you were at this time. To talk about this, to elaborate on this, I'm very glad to have with us tonight a very important guest whom we've had before. You may recall that Colonel Julie Hall, a retired Air Force colonel, <coughs> ran a few years ago against Jake, um, Joe Biden can do no wrong, Auchincloss, a congressman who's been with, from Newton, who's been with us now for a few years. And if things don't change, we'll be with us for another few years. So obviously we're going to try to change that as soon as we can. <clears throat> but nevertheless, Julie Hall <coughs> is a very impressive <coughs> individual in the fact that she retired as a full colonel from the Air Force, but she is currently hold, wears 
three Republican crowns, and that is she was a full delegate to the Republican National Convention in Milwaukee this past summer. <coughs> she is a Republican State Committee woman from Attleboro, and she was the co-chair, along with Richie McGarry of Newton, of the Massachusetts Veterans for Trump, which actually de facto was the New England Veterans for Trump, <coughs> in which they reached out to veterans um, groups and um, Trump groups throughout the country to solidify the veteran support for Donald Trump, which, by the way, wasn't really hard to do because veterans support Trump as well they should, as do military personnel. So, Colonel Hall, it is wonderful to have you here Thank again, you. Julie. Thank you. It's an honor to it's be here. It really is. Yes. And, you know, we've been through this, through various elections, good and bad, your yes. own especially, mm -hmm. a few years ago where you ran a gallant campaign to, <coughs> to run and you lost, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And it's the ebb and flow of politics. But now we've come out of this election cycle with a with a result that I don't think any of us really dared to comprehend, right. with, whereby we won we won the trifecta, right? And honestly, we would have been happy with winning the presidency mm -hmm. and the, let the others uh, do what they may. But still, we won all three, and it's a wonderful time for our party. Fr quite frankly, it's a wonderful time <coughs> for an American. Now, you and I were together at the convention in Milwaukee, and we had a great time there. Yeah, it was fun. It was really a lot of fun. Yeah. And as I recall, you wore a colonial, uh, blue, and, blue and white colonial yes, um, Revolutionary War right. uniform. And you were, I think that you were the most photographed delegate on the convention That's floor. Because you told. looked really yes. amazing yeah. there. You really did. Thank you. <coughs> and you were there on the floor the whole time. And it was really a wonderful time to be there. And it was wonderful. It was really a great party and a, a great small P party, and, and everyone was so nice and kind and generous and great. Now, did you envision at that convention that we would win? Now, be honest, that we yeah. would win the trifecta, or did you think that we would just win the presidency? Because I'll tell you, I thought we'd win the presidency. I was cautiously optimistic, but I never even dared hope that we would win the trifecta, the Republican trifecta. Yeah, I was really uh, <coughs> surprised in a very, very positive way. And, um, you know, I think even more than just winning the presidency, the fact that he won everything and the popular vote, he won, so it's even more than a trifecta, Tom, he won the popular vote too. And that was a direct message, and it needed to be a very strong message to this country that things that were going on, people were just going too far. And I think even the Democrats have been saying that lately, as you know, we just, we just pushed <coughs> things too far. And, you know, I was just hoping that in some way the country would push back and say, hey, listen, we don't want socialism. We like being American citizens. We like America the way it was. And uh, I think that message really needed to be made or we could be in a whole different direction now. You know, Colonel, also, I think that uh, the Democrats this time, they were in a no-win situation in that they had really two terrible candidates right. running. First, Joe Biden. He would not have won. And second, they had Kamala Harris, who yeah. was really a bad candidate. I mean, she was so bad that when she ran in 2020, she didn't even make it to the Iowa caucus. She had to drop out before that. She didn't get a single um, delegate vote, right. which was which was very unusual that, that a Biden would pick her as vice president. But I think a lot of that had to do with her the fact that she was female and that she was oh, half black. Yeah, yeah. It was really a tokenism. And um, I think that the Obama people pressured him to do that. And then, of course, when she finally got the nod, after, they, after the Democrats basically staged a coup led by Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, and Obama to get rid of Biden, they set him up unbelievably so. And they, and they got rid of him, and he stepped on, and then Kamala stepped in. And she was an amazingly inept candidate. And the people right. who were running her campaign were amazingly inept in that we won, uh, we basically won every contested state, all the contested mm -hmm. states, and we won, and, accor and according to the demographics, we won the Hispanic vote, we had a huge turnout with the black vote, female vote. I mean, you go down the line, we won mm -hmm. or had impressive gains in just about every so, category. Yeah, I, wasn't, I wasn't surprised <laughs> um, about how that went. And there were a couple of things that were indicators for me. You know, the first thing I wanted to say is, you know, just their rhetoric that they use, their campaign slogans, you know, I have to say, 
I feel very unburdened by what, by what could have been. Yes, indeed. Okay. And I'm very joyful that they didn't win. I mean, to have those kinds of things, well, we're going to be joyful. And J.D. Vance was weird. And, you know, I was like, what is this stuff that's mm -hmm. going on? And nobody, it was just horrible, horrible. People asked me about um, the identity politics that they played. Well, if you're going to play identity politics, you better have somebody like Margaret Thatcher or Condoleezza Rice running, okay? Um, she did not carry herself, as I would think, in the way of leader, a, a leader, period. You know, I've been in the military. I've had to be challenged with those same obstacles of my, um, my gender. And I knew that there were women that were not going to vote for her, the same reason the women didn't vote for Hillary. It's the same kind of thing. But I also knew, and they were trying to set up that the men were going to vote for her and all these women. It was a very small group of very loud people that were saying that they were going to vote for her. And they, you know, the fact that they tried to shame everybody. Um, I'm going to give you, for instance, Julie, Julie Roberts did a, 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 voice, a voiceover yeah. basically telling women that if they wanted to vote for Donald Trump, it was okay. You could sneak. We don't want to sneak. That's a bad message. You shouldn't be telling women that they have to be sneaky. We've got our voice. You see? Yes. And so everything they did was well, the, counterproductive. The guilt, trip, the guilt trip certainly didn't work. You know, um, I think the Democrats have a very condescending view of the American people. And um, they assume that people, will, women will vote for, would have voted for her, Kamala, right. because she's a woman. And of right. course they're going to vote for her. And of course, all the blacks are going to vote for her because she's black. Well, it didn't happen. Right. And because and people, the American people have much more are much more in tuned to politics to what's going on than the Democrats care to admit. They have common sense. They have dignity. They're smart. Whether they're farmers in Iowa, whether they work in the Mississippi Delta as 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 shrimp fishermen, whether they work construction work construction jobs. They're very much in tune with what's going on. They have common sense, and they decided, based on what they were seeing, <coughs> which with 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 what what was happening to their country, on the border, yeah. uh, with Mexico, with the influx of millions of illegals into this country, and the foreign policy that we're almost getting into wars in the Middle East, and also with with Eastern Europe, with Russia and Ukraine, they decided, and in addition to what they saw in their pocketbooks with inflation rising, gas prices rising, that enough is enough. That they would put their trust in Trump, whom at least they knew from before. And they could remember that, gee, it didn't cost 30 to $40 to bring a whole family to McDonald's um, in 2018 when Trump was president. It didn't cost $50 to fill up a, a tank of gas as when Trump was president. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can get back to that. But, you know, one of the issues that I was a little concerned <coughs> about was the abortion issue. And, you know, and I kind of blame Republicans for that. We're kind of the ones that, that brought that up into the front and center. But that actually turned against them also because it was a singular issue. And there were so many other things that women certainly were concerned about. Right. You we know, were concerned about, you yeah. know, what happened with... Um, you know, Riley Gaines and trans, you know, transgenders women, and sports. Women in, uh, men in women's sports. There are so many things. And I had people saying, oh, you know, a, a women's body themselves. And I said, you're probably the same person who told me that I had to take a shot. So yes. that was my body. My, is it my choice? Yes. Same people. So they forget, unfortunately, that they took a stance this time. But now they're going to say, okay, but we, it was very selective. They're very selective about, you know, what they believe is the right and wrong things. And they forget that, you know, um, and, and with women in particular, um, that's one of the things I told somebody one time is I fought very much for my rights as a woman, that I wasn't supporting women if I didn't vote for Kamala Harris. I'm like, that's totally ridiculous. I fight for women all the time. And, you know, to use that against people. If she was a great candidate, I might have thought about it, but she was a horrible candidate. But, you, you know, also, also Julie, um, the Democrats live in, a, in a, a bubble of their own making, a very liberal bubble, and they only seem to speak to and congregate with each other, and especially with their media friends, of which there are many. Right. And they don't really understand, or, or and I think they're totally clueless as to how the average American thinks and what is important to the average American. Well, what is important to the average American is not some 
obscure distant war in Ukraine, or th or things of or transgender rights, or kids getting tr getting um, gender changing operations in schools, and boys getting into women's locker rooms and bathrooms. Mm -hmm. um, it's important to them, but it's not important to the rest of us right. across the spectrum. Black, black, white, Hispanic, mm -hmm. Indian, mm -hmm. I mean, Jew, Gentile, you name it. And, you know, what was interesting, too, is that Donald Trump appealed to many different groups, but what surprised me most <coughs> was that even the Muslims, and I'm saying even the Muslims, but the Muslims of the Muslim community of Michigan, a very important contested state, voted with Trump. Right. <coughs> now, why would they vote with Trump? For the reasons that I just stated. Yeah. They don't want to, they don't want boys in girls locker rooms. They don't want their kids to come home and saying that, their boys saying that they feel like a girl and I want to get a sex change operation. And they go to the gas pump and, and I'd have to deal with the same prices that we do in the supermarket and, and so on and so forth. So I think that it was a combination of two things, really three things actually. Um, the economic issues, which right. I just stated, the social issues, which I, I stated, but and also um, the general picture and and the most specific pressing issue outside of their own personal lives in their own personal um, neighborhoods was the situation on the border. Yeah. Essentially, the border has been so porous and mm -hmm. so insanely open. It's, and it's the Biden administration basically said to the world, come on in. Right. And that's what's been happening. We have millions of people that are here now. Right. And that, that's an issue. And, and I had this conversation <coughs> with one of the reporters from, I think, Mass Inc. They were asking me what I thought about the election. I'm like, how could you worry about all these other issues when your country <clears throat> isn't safe? So we have invited dangerous people inside to our country. We have China chomping at the bit. We've got Iran chomping at the bit. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got North Korea mm -hmm. all waiting to swoop in on us. And, you know, Russia's the least of our worries. They're, you know, still fighting Ukraine. They're fighting that, that proxy battle over there. But when you have these three people, you know, that are trying to be waiting to come into this country, and you have the enemy within, you're in a very, really, really bad place. And I think what, you know, I know there's a lot of misconception in my mind about what Trump is going to do. I fully hope that he goes and they find out who these dangerous people are that were let into this country and gets rid of those dangerous people. Because if we don't, we're going to have another September 11th coming up. My impression is that um, the most pressing issue that Trump is going to pursue is, is the border issue. And mm -hmm halting the illegal immigration into the country, but also deporting as many of the illegals as he can. And you can tell by tell that by the people that he's put in key positions for his next administration. Stephen Miller, who is a hawk on halting illegal immigration. He's now uh, the deputy White House chief of staff, I think. You have Kirstie Noem. Got Holman back who, on the border. Yeah, Kirstie yep. Noem, who's yep. the governor of, of South Dakota. Yep. She's now the head, she will be the head of, of, um, of um, Homeland Security, and then of course you have Tom Homan, who's a hawk above all hawks right, right. at stopping the immigrants, right. illegals well, from coming in. One look at the guy. If you're an illegal immigrant, you want to run the other way. The guy looks like a right. rhinoceros. And he's he very, very like outspoken and pushed back on Congress when they go after <coughs> You know, one of the things I see, I, I'm going to segue a little bit into Massachusetts here. You know, we're taking a stance. You hear people take a stance. We're not going to, you know, cooperate. Well, What's going to happen is the federal dollars are going to be cut off. Mm -hmm. There are Democrat <coughs> representatives and Republican representatives in our own state that are already pushing back and having difficulties with their own constituents. It doesn't matter what party they're in. Their towns are in an uproar about the resources. They don't have the resources. They don't have the infrastructure to take care of all of these Im immigrants that have come in. And that's been a problem. And it doesn't matter what, what party you're in. Now, if Haley continues to say that Together. and the funds get cut off, it's going to be a problem. <coughs> well, I, the funds will be cut yeah. off eventually because um, Donald Trump and Tom Homan are not going to put up with it. And Mari Haley has brought in tens of thousands of illegal immigrants. I don't like calling them migrants. They're illegal immigrants. Right. She's brought in tens of thousands to the tune of, I believe, the last count was it cost a billion dollars a year to maintain them. <coughs> and eventually... Uh, even under the Biden administration, the 
or the funds would have been cut off from the federal government, in which case the state had to assume the cost, which they are now, and then the state would eventually right. turn the costs over to the local communities. And um, on January 20th, the flow of the illegals into our Commonwealth, into Massachusetts, will stop. The question is, what do we do with the ones that we right. have? Right. And the exactly. answer is simply that ICE and the federal marshals will have to get them out. And I don't think, aside from the hardcore liberals at Harvard and Cambridge and elsewhere, that the average person is going to be too upset at them leaving the Commonwealth. Because, quite frankly, they're just not supposed to be here. They shouldn't have been let in in the first place. And so we're going to get them out. It will take some time, but they will, they will get out. And the border will be sealed. I have heard that on January 20th that Trump, Donald Trump, will, or will I guess, give a verbal order to the border patrol, to the directors of the border patrol on the Rio Grande Valley, to not to let anyone in. It stops. Just stop. Mm -hmm. No one gets let in. And he's very serious about it. And the wall that he started um, in his administration under great duress, with great difficulty, will be completed. And it will go from San Diego in the Pacific all the way to Brownsville, Texas on the Gulf of Mexico. And you know what? Walls work. You build the right wall, oh. you make it impenetrable, mm -hmm. <coughs> they work. Well, look at this. What country do you know of that you can just walk into? That's right. You can't even walk into Canada. You, know, <coughs> you, can't, you can't walk into Canada. There's still a border between North and South Korea that's armed. I, don't, I think <coughs> a lot of people forget that. There is a border between North and South Korea that is armed. There are still armed Americans and armed North Koreans that, you know, so, so everywhere I've been, I mean, there's borders and there's borders to keep people out. And there's a reason why they want to keep people out. So the fact that we just opened ours up is goes against you know, all the thinking of security of, of, of the countries, of every country that I could possibly think of. And yet the great United States of America. You know, Julie, there's a, there's a precedent for this in of all countries, Israel. Now, prior to the terrorist onslaught against Israel last year, Israel was and is still is a very affluent country. So um, it has a border with the Sinai Desert, which mm -hmm. is sort of like the um, Mojave Desert in California and Arizona. But and never and what would happen is a lot of the African immigrants, um, illegals, would come in into Israel from Sudan, Ethiopia, and places like that. They would cross the border because the border was pretty much open. And Israel wasn't so much concerned with terrorism on that border with right. Egypt as they are in Lebanon and Jordan. <clears throat> but there was no fence on the border, so the illegal immigrant problem became so acute in Israel that they had to build a fence, and they built it quickly from the Mediterranean to the Red Sea a long straight fence along the border, and the illegal immigration stopped. Now, obviously, they have security problems, right. but the immigration, but the, the point uh, uh, that I'm raising is that <coughs> fences work, and they will work. Yes, they do. And with the United States. Now, another thing that, that the Biden administration uh, did dramatically and deliberately was um, to stop the, the great pipeline, which was going from Alberta, Canada, through the Dakotas right. to the Gulf of Mexico to bring all the Canadian oil down to the Gulf ports and to ship them around the world. On day one of Biden's administration, the day of his inauguration, he signed an, ex an executive order stopping that. Why? Nobody, they, they never justified or never told the public why they were doing this, but they did it. In which case, gas prices and oil prices went through the roof. Your heating oil, all of our heating orders will be very high this year. Next year they won't be because Trump will get a handle on it. <clears throat> but the country under Trump was not only energy self-sufficient, but was quickly becoming an energy exporter. And that's what Trump wants to do again, make the country an energy exporter. So um, there's a lot in the administration over four years that they will do and need to do in a four-year period because Donald Trump's already been president four years. Now he's going to be four years again. He's in four years, and that's it. So he's in a hurry to get all of his appointments in place, mm -hmm. and he's picked most of his cabinet and agency secretaries, and, um, and he wants to put them in. He doesn't want to wait for congressional or Senate approval. Why? Not because he's afraid that they won't be approved. They will with the Republican Senate. But really because of the fact, because of the fact that, um, that what will happen is um, he's in a hurry to get things done. Yeah. And, and, that's quite you know, and some yeah. of the appointments that he's made, I mean, you know, every day I look at some of the appointments that he's made, I'm saying, oh, my God, this is brilliant. Robert F. Kennedy, 
Jr. for a Health I mean, and Human Services I have to tell you, some Secretary. of them I just was like, what? It, it's just, just unbelievable. Marco Rubio people? for Secretary yeah. of State, Peg yeah. Hexworth yeah. for Secretary of Defense. I mean, the list goes on and on. And but, these but are, look at the things. He's picking people out of all different backgrounds, too. Yes. They're not all just, you know, these are, you know, Pete Hesick. I mean, he is just incredible. So these are uh, these are yeah. really uh, people. These are the people these who are, are these are the who average are, everyday person who were at our there. convention and yeah. spoke so yeah. eloquently. Yeah. And you know, my favorites are Elon Musk and Vivek Ramaswamy. Yeah. Right. I, had, uh, I mean, these guys are magnificent. Yeah. Self-made billionaires. Are, I think I alone. Say, is, yeah. I said is, average everyday people, yeah. but these are brilliant. Alone is, is I think <laughs> still the richest woman. person in the world. Yeah. But what they want to do on day one is to bring the size of government down by 50 to 80 yeah. percent. Vivek said something wonderful the other day. I almost jumped out of my seat and started cheering. What he said he wants to do on day one, the Trump administration, January 20th, he's going to put out an order that all federal workers have to come back to work and work from 9 to 5 every day, Monday to Friday. Most of them are at home doing nothing or doing the, mm -hmm. the, uh, the uh, what do you remote call it, work. remote work. And so his idea was, well, when you give that order out, about 25% of them will retire or just quit. Mm -hmm. And then what he wants to do is move departments, like the Department of Agriculture to the Midwest, the Department of Energy to Texas. It makes sense. The farmland is in the Midwest. Right. right. And the energy is right. in that Texas. Is, that is and then he said, and then if that happens, when when it happens, that he said another 15% will leave because they, they won't want to relocate. Yeah, relocate. So the idea is to the idea is to get rid of a lot of these dead weight in the um, in the in the federal government and to just reverse the trend that's been going on for 100 years and get these people out of office. Julie uh, Colonel, uh, this is the fastest 30 minutes in. I know we could talk and for we could I mean, talk for a lot. And I wish a lot we of could, issues. but I want to bring people's attention to two things. Um, the mass GOP is alive and well, and we are moving, and this is the front page of the Herald today. Our chairwoman, Amy Connervalli, we're very proud of her. She's doing a great job, and we appreciate the efforts that she's do, making on our behalf. The other thing I want to mention is um, Jenny Griman was a great Republican, and she was a wonderful woman who served in the Reagan administration and was also at every convention, a Republican convention and, and inauguration since, and she passed away a month shy of her 77th birthday. She was a magnificent woman from Wellesley in our district, and we're going to miss her greatly. And I was at the funeral the other day where a lot of good Republicans were there, and she was friends to every Republican um, governor and Senator Brown, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll, we'll miss her. But what I also want to say is Thanksgiving is upon us. Yes. Wonderful things are going to happen. It's a great thing. And it's Lots going to be, to be we're going to be thankful for so many things. And a year yeah. from now, even the Democrats will, will shake their heads in, in, uh, in unison and say things aren't that bad. Things are actually pretty good. Yeah. So that being said, Colonel, we got to have you on again. I'd love to. I'd love to have. We'd love to do this again. So have a wonderful Thanksgiving Same to all to of you. our viewers as Same. well. And Thanksgiving, very, everybody. And a very uh, happy holiday. Merry yeah. Christmas, happy Hanukkah, and a happy New Year's. It's going to be great. We look forward to it. Very good. Thank you.